Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Just Food panel. I'm really excited to uh, have you all here today. I uh, taught the course in the fall, and I had the most incredible group of students. It was very hard to select free papers because so many of them were great. And um, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I actually fed them vegan macaroni and cheese. I made a cheese sauce out of other ingredients, and we had some really fun times in that class. But uh, at any rate, I do want to introduce our speakers today. The first speaker up is Sam Lyon. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I'll just give you a few details about Sam. He's a CRS major and a double minor in Spanish and nonprofit management. Uh, he's active in student government um, and a member of the Oglethorpe Diversity Board. Uh, he works in the Office of, of Admissions, you may have seen him there, and has been very active on spring break trips, been to at least three different places. Four, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Who's counting? Yeah. And uh, ultimately hopes to attend law school after graduation. Uh, I'm going to introduce all three of them so that we can just get into the talks, and we're going to save our questions for the end, unless you absolutely have a burning question. but. Uh, I'm hoping we can save all the questions to the end. Um, our next panelist is uh, Chris Strickland. Uh, many of you may know Chris. Um, Chris uh, was raised in Columbus, Georgia, and is a communication major and politics minor. Uh, he is going to be applying for an MPA JD program upon graduation and uh, eventually hopes to run for office. That's definitely the plan we talked about almost from his very first semester here at Oglethorpe. And he is the founder of the Oglethorpe Diversity Board and a proud brother of Kappa Sigma. Okay. And then uh, our, our last speaker is Alexis Shepard. Hi, Alexis. Okay. And she is a pre-law and engineering major from Boston and um, is ultimately in pursuit of her PhD in sustainability. Uh, she has started taking more CRS courses and we're glad to have her join our ranks. Uh, she's hanging out with us a lot more these days. And uh, she is interested in understanding and providing adaptive, sustainable solutions to the dynamic socioeconomic issues facing the world today. So thank you all for being here and um, our first talk is uh, by Sam, tentative trials, inroads into the modern food system. Thank God for this one. Uh, Chris, you're going to be a prop for me? I want to make sure that. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so just a brief overview of my presentation. We're going to go through the food system, uh, all the way from production, that being harvesting and planting, up until consumption. Um, which is considered in this presentation the buying of the product. Um, so as this was a rhetoric class, and not everybody in here is a rhetorician, um, I figured it'd be okay to go over a quick theory overview. Um, a couple of the theories I'm gonna be talking about today are dramatism by Kenneth Burke. Um, Burke is a really central uh, theory towards food rhetoric. Um, and overall has a lot of different tenets, um, including the dramatistic pentad, which adapts Aristotelian logic, um, but also um, he has the god and devil terms, which is um, what we're gonna be looking at today. Um, I also use standpoint theory, which focuses on marginalized groups, um, which is more used towards workers um, in this. Uh, Harding and Wood said that those in power shape the way others see the world, so um, that's what we're gonna be focusing on with that. And then muted group theory, which identifies low power groups, um, and those in power have to change their language to match those in higher power. So as long as everybody understands those three uh, theories and their basic tenets, we should be okay moving forward. So we start with food production. Um, a lot of the food system, um, well all of the food system really has to begin with the production of food, um, and that begins with planting and harvesting. Um, so. Uh, there's something in food rhetoric called the white farm imaginary, um, where all production and sales of food go through um, like either white salesmen um, in supermarkets or white salesmen in uh, food courts or uh, farmers markets. Um, 
what isn't shown is that in the U.S., 75% of field workers are Hispanic, um, primarily Mexican, and they're paid an average of 6.76 uh, an hour. Um, the living wage in California, which is where most of these workers work, is $12.83 an hour. Um, so as you can see, that's well below the living wage. Um, but why is it well below the living wage? Um, we looked a lot in the class about uh, the agency that people have towards changing um, their uh, status in society. And it turns out that uh, immigrant workers don't have a lot of power in changing um, their plight. Uh, a couple reasons for this, including uh, visa problems as well as deportation issues. Um, the people who run the farms will hire migrant workers and get, promise them a higher wage, a living wage, um, normally around uh, $10 an hour, um, but then pay them this, and when they complain, they'll just um, either call the police or revoke their visa, um, their worker visa. Um, so workers are really afraid to um, argue their price. Um, it's also because of the perception of farm workers. Um, the idea of um, like Jose working the farm and like providing food for your family is something that's perpetuated not only through fast food corporations such as McDonald's and Burger King, but also supermarkets and advertising, um, as I'm sure Dr. Damari can tell you. Um, so moving into the conception of food, this is uh, what we call the white farm imaginary. It's a pretty good example of a farmer's market. Um, and this is a theory um, that McCullen came up with. Um, the theory states that we assume those who sell us the food also produce the food, but it's not the case as we just saw. Um, McCullen, who uh, wrote a whole book about this idea, um, asserts that the symbols, narrative values, and institutions influence the public. It's to believe that agriculture is built on a white family structure um, who work the land and that Latino farmers are left primarily out of the discussion, um, which is a problem um, not only for the Latino workers, but also for us who perceive food differently than it actually is. Um, according to the standpoint <laughs> theory um, that we discussed previously, uh, the Latino group is therefore uh, marginalized and forced to um, not have a public voice in there. Not that they have to change their standpoint, but rather they don't have a standpoint whatsoever. Um, there's a couple reasons why this per continues to perpetuate, and one of those is corporate control. Um, we're controlled by a few, the food system is controlled by a very few companies, um, and there's a few different things that this leads into. One of those is limited choice in food species. Um, uh, with perceived plentitude of choices in supermarkets and food markets. Um, so as you see this picture, um, just out of curiosity, opening the floor for this, how many, uh, how many of you think that you have choice when you see this? Like, if you can hit the light down. Sure. When you see all of this, there's a lot of different varieties of chip brands. So like, if you guys were asked, do you have a choice, would you say yes, you do have a choice in this? Right. Um, turns out that every one of these is controlled by PepsiCo. Um, Lay's, Ruffles, Doritos, um, Fritos, and uh, Rolled Gold are all controlled by Lay's. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, they're controlled by PepsiCo. Um, and as such, uh, the perception of food um, and food choice is kind of skewed. Um, Additionally, there's um, the food genome, which is growing shorter and shorter every day. Um, and this has to do with genetically modified organisms, um, as well as uh, food uh, needs by the country and abroad. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of Monsanto. Um, Monsanto seed continues to um, become stronger and stronger each day. Um, and this is due to cross-pollinization in fields, as well as um, litigation in courtrooms where uh, Monsanto will actually sue farmers who have uh, the, their field and their crop that didn't pay for that year. Um, because of this, a lot of farms who are smaller and will have their own seed, like a family seed, um, will go out of, biz out of business and the land will be bought by Monsanto um, at a lower rate than they would have had if they just bought into the system already. Um, and they'll go Monsanto is very open about going to these people and saying, like, you either do this or we're like, we'll take you over in five years. Um, and it's kind of an aggressive tactic on Monsanto's part. Um, so there's a few different texts if anybody's interested in looking into this. Um, Stuff and Starved, which talks about the ins institutionalization of corporate farming, um, and the American way of eating, which discusses choices people make in supermarkets and why there's a limited um, supply of 
of choices. Um, rhetorically speaking, the corporate um, control isn't portrayed, portrayed properly in the media, which limits our choice um, and our freedoms towards um, making uh, coherent choices. Um, some God terms and devil terms that they use, of course, like low, uh, non-fat, low-fat, low-starch, um, not with these particular products. Um, but these are all just arbitrary terms um, that don't really have anything, like what is low-fat, like nobody really knows what low-fat is, um, what kind of percentage that is. Um, so they're just using terms in order to market appropriately, um, which is a problem. So if you've taken any of Dr. Shikande's classes, I'm sure you've seen this chart um, about media control and media concentration. Um, it shows the top six corporations that have um, control over the media. Um, and people get really aggressive about this, but what you might not have known is who controls the food system. Um, so these 10 companies control 95% of the food system. Um, and the independents are normally in either breweries or um, organic like health brands, which are being bought up every day. Um, so finally, moving from all that, we come into a consumer choice, which is, of all the groups, the most unassuming. Um, so factors that go into buying food from a consumer standpoint, convenient, convenience, economic situation, brand reputation, labeling, placement of supermarkets, and health benefits. Um, but of all of these, the most controlled is the economic situation um, by corporations. So corporations will place supermarkets within uh, certain cities. Um, and within these cities, um, they'll have them in high-income areas, so low-income people will have to buy uh, food from uh, liquor stores and gas stations, and that's their only way to buy food. And Detroit is a really good example of this. I think within the city limit of Detroit, there's only one supermarket in the wealthiest part of town. Um, and because of this, people are forced to buy unhealthy foods, um, like chips and uh, soft, uh, soft drinks. Um, which perpetuates the problem. There's a really good book that talks about this uh, by Michael Moss called Salt, Sugar, Fat. It talks about the addiction that uh, corporations will put um, towards uh, salt, sugar, and fat, and how each of those affect us biologically, psychologically, and how we have a craving for them. Um, also perpetuated by all of this, um, and which goes into factoring of consumer choice, um, is how the branding of uh, commercials go into each different supermarket and product. Um, so normally um, we see men as helpless to cook, women who are the primary caregivers and um, like will do all the shopping and whatnot. If, and if the men are doing the shopping, they're normally clueless in doing so. Um, and this is a problem because more and more women are working each year um, and as a whole like it's a different issue, but like more women are working. Um, so, but they still want to provide that family meal <coughs> for their families. Um, and as such, the fast food corporations as well as supermarkets have started selling slow food, um, which is an interesting concept in and of itself. But if you think of rotisserie chicken and the little boxes you can get at like Publix or Kroger, um, which are meant to provide a simulated home experience. Um, so moving on to advocacy, how can we change any of this um, from the farm worker not getting paid to us not having freedom of choice? Um, what are the inroads into the tentative trials of the food system? Um, so there are labeling laws. Um, Proposition 37 um, was just shot down, which prevented uh, GMO, which prevented GMOs from being labeled on um, food products. Um, there's also only buying at farmers markets and growers markets, which have more organic selections as well as uh, different family seeds. There's the Bicot app, um, and this is available in the app marketplace. So this morning when I told them I was going to present, they gave me this bottle of Dasani water. Um, so I scanned it this morning just out of curiosity. Um, according to the Bicot app, um, which has programmed into my preferences, so I'm anti-GMO, so I don't buy products with GMOs in them, um, Dasani is given um, $1.7 million to Prop 7 uh, Proposition 37 in 2012, which is when it was shot down. Um, so they were lobbying for, um, they were lobbying against GMO labeling, um, which is why this is unopened right now. <laughs> yeah. um, there's also local events, which are boycotts, which might be the more extreme, but also discussions. So there was a Farmers to 40 uh, discussion on campus last week, um, or four earlier this week, been a long week. Um, 
but uh, things like that can just open the door towards discussing food. People don't talk about food enough, and as such, um, don't feel comfortable and feel like it's an appropriate discussion, but it's definitely something um, that we should all take into consideration uh, moving forward. Um, so that is my presentation. Here are my references. Um, unless anybody has any burning questions, um, I think we'll move forward first. Yeah. take a lot of what Sam discusses and puts it into a political type context. Um, <clears throat> dubbing something a genocide is usually a, a pretty steep statement, but I hope, um, oh I know after I present that you'll kind of get a feel for it. So look to the glistening golden arches of a McDonald's restaurant sign and you may get caught up in the glamorous refulgence that means to symbolize healthy and fast food choices for you and your family. Go to your nearest public supermarket and stare in awe at how ravishing the shining apples look sitting atop their mousy brown cardboard and choose the shiniest one, knowing deep down it has to be the healthiest so shiny. Listen to the eloquent rants of Monsanto and buy into their claim that genetically modified seeds are the stepping stone into an era of global sustainability. And as you are deafened more and more by the sensationalist media boasting positive American food values and capitalistic freedom, Realize that in the foreground is the silent jingle of rusty shackles and the growing of a middle and lower class citizen who has been forced to sell their health for corporate success as he or she has led to a smoke chamber lab labeled poverty and terminal health conditions. To avoid this new age uh, class genocide fueled by corporate conglomerates working toward a, a profit motive and trampling over your health, you must lift the shroud that has been draped over your eyes and educate yourself on the reality. My presentation will amplify the song of these chains with the help of scholars such as Raj Patel, Michael Moss, and Tracy McMillan. I will first paint a picture um, of the history of the struggle between the powerful and the powerless through the lens of Marx and Engels in their prophetic communist manifesto. Then through the writings of Michael Moss and Tracy McMillan, I will show how this fight is being waged today with the upper class having an upper hand with its claim on the market and our taste buds. Finally, I will move to the repercussions of this long-lasting battle in the realm of food, namely what is, what is to be known as a food-oriented class genocide, including who are the players in the process of the genocide, the victims, the effects, and how we can begin to take a stand and move toward the future. So, I dubbed the genocide. Um, this is a picture of Raphael Lemkin. Um, he was a Jewish international author um, and lawyer and, create, and creator of the term genocide. Um, so, dubbing food inequality is a progression into a food class genocide. Raphael Lipkin, um, 
a, a Jewish lawyer who coined the term genocide while working to indict Nazi Germany for crimes against humanity, defines genocide as such. Generally speaking, genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be the disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. It is through food, as my premise follows, that the food industry elicits a genocide in the middle, lower, and poor economic classes in the U.S. and even abroad. It penetrates your health, grabs it by the core, and milks it of its beneficiary aspects so that the industry can gain a profit. As a result, an entire class of people who can't afford to shun the food industry are slowly left to die as they ingest overly processed food products. So a premise of transcendence. A genocide cannot be empowered without immense political might. In modern day America, there exists behind every grocery aisle and massive meat packaging freezer an epic as timeless as history itself. It is a story of a bloody struggle between the have and the have nots, the upper echelon and the lower tax bracket, the producers and the consumers. The prophets Karl Marx and Frederick Engels have predicted in their piece, The Communist Manifesto, such a struggle would last well past their days, giving the opposing sides the labels bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In the food industry, one can get a front row seat of this battle between the industrial powerhouse and the often ignorant but slowly rising proletariat. According to these two philosophers, the history of all um, here through to um, existing society is the history of class struggles. Much like today, they go on to say that the working class proletariat are fighting in the class struggle against the owners of the means of production, the bourgeoisie. And that past class struggle ended either with a revolution that restructured society or a redoubled effort of the bourgeoisie to re-solidify its dominance. Put major food corporations in the place of the bourgeoisie and the lower middle and lower class in the shoes of the proletariat, and what is seen is an eerie similarity between a text written almost 200 years ago and the way in which McDonald's, with its cartoon campaigning and its low prices, get you to religiously consume its products. In Raj Patel's Stuffed and Starved, the hidden battle for the world food system, we see the nucleus of food production firmly in the hands of a few food corporations, with the fate of our nutrition at the hands of a quick processing scheme. In his words, as far as power is concerned, the bottleneck is the central clue. Somehow, we've ended up at a world with a few corporate buyers and sellers. The process of shipping, processing, and trucking food across distances demands a great deal of capital. You need to be rich to play this game. And when the number of companies controlling the gateways from farmers to consumers is small, this gives them market power both over the people who grow and the people who eat. In Moss's Salt, Sugar, and Fat, we see how corporations pervade our taste buds by brainwashing our minds into believing that the chemicals and processed foods are actually packed with nutrition. Um, Moss, he explores this idea of industrial chemical warfare in salt, sugar, fat. With the careful synthesis of the three, salt, sugar, and fat, um, which has been used since the birth of food processing as a means to get consumers to consume the, until they cannot consume anymore. As Moss contends, in each and every snack we partake in and deem the most delicious, there exists compounds such as salt, which was processed in dozens of ways to maximize the joke that taste buds would feel with the very first bite. They had the fats, which delivered the biggest loads of calories and worked more subtly in inducing people to overeat. Um, and they had sugar, whose raw power in exciting the mind made it perhaps the most formidable ingredient of all. Performing countless experiments and taste tests, food corporations have finally found the key to our stomachs, our brains. Certain chemical mixtures, regardless of their devastating effects in our bodies, uh, food corporations have become scientific in the way in which they have figured out the human tongue. In the realm of sugar, food manufacturers are well aware of the tongue map following, along with a whole lot more about why we crave sweets. They have on staff cadres of scientists who specialize in the senses, and the companies use their knowledge to put sugar to work for them in countless ways. 
Sugar not only makes the taste of food and drink irresistible, the industry has learned that it can also be used to pull off a string of manufacturing miracles, from donuts that fry up bigger to bread that won't go stale. Food giants have found the holy taste genome, genome that keeps consumers coming. With their superior means of production and its scientific exploration into the minds of the consumers, corporations dominate upon the throne of processing dynamism and mental brainwash. There exists a backstory to the many narrative and, and expositions done by Patel, Macmillan, and Moss. It is a classic told countless years ago by the famous prophets Marx and Engels, who were told of, of a society where two clashes, two um, societies or groups of people would clash, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. In other words, the bourgeoisie was characteristic of more massive and more colossal productive forces than of all preceding generations together. Um, subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, applications of chemistry to industry and agriculture. The proletariat, however, is below the bourgeoisie, consisting of the blue collar individuals who are employed up under the upper class. The lower strata of the middle class the small tra tradespeople, shopkeepers, and retired tradesmen. Generally, the hands craftsmen and peasants. All of these sink gradually into the proletariat. And as contended by these two great philosophers, the fight between the two are eternal. Each generation orchestrates a mighty class struggle. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in a constant opposition to one another carried on an uninterrupted and now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time, either in a revolution, revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or in common ruin of the contending classes. Patel, Macmillan, and Moss all have depicted this modern class struggle of today's food industry. Consumers are shackled by the addictive chemical makeup of major food corporations' fatty products. Farmers are enslaved by market prices that big time corporations who have the ability to transform, refuse to revamp because the end goal is and always will be the profit motive. But what happens when all this leads to the destruction of an entire class of people? So food industrial power. Um, I'm sure you've also seen this diagram in a lot of media studies and um, food studies even. Um, this is how, like, the, as far as processing goes, it's all consolidated to a number, only a very small number of uh, producers. You see Coca-Cola, Kraft, Nestle, P&G, PepsiCo, all in the middle, and then you see on the outside all these other uh, things that they endorse and process. And so, food industrial power. The entire story is based on the conquest from power and money. It's a story of colonialism, control over channels of production, distribution, marketing and finance, mobilization of national interests, and a racialized painting of the third world. Ten organizations, including such icons as PepsiCo Inc., Tyson Foods Inc., Nestle and General Mills Inc. containing a concentrated amount of power from those areas above mentioned can literally dominate the world. Here's what the power looks like applied to today. The 10 largest companies control half of the world's seed supply. The top 10 comp uh, companies control 63% of nearly US 20, uh, 20 uh, billion dollar US dollars, veterinary drug market. Uh, 10 firms control 90% of the nearly 38.6 billion dollar pesticide market while the top six controlling 75% of the market, with analysts pointing to a trend in concentration that will see, by 2015, only three major players in that sector. The top 10 in food and beverage processing account for 26% of, of $1.3 trillion of U.S. dollars, market and packaged foods. In the market with the sharpest trends in concentration, retail sees the top 100 players accounting for 35% of the U.S. $400 trillion dollars in the market, with Walmart alone accounting for 10% of that share. Here we see a group of few deciding the fate of the many from retail to meat park packaging. So as far as media power, another power major food co corporations have is the creation of meanings associated with their products. To combat claims from ardent food critics and empiricism, many food corporations have endorsed their products as nutritious, using God terms such as organic and low calorie painting an elusive picture of health. For example, Coca-Cola has made its claim to fame on the health scene by boasting of its many low and non-calorie drink choices. In the US and in the UK, more than a third of the colas we sell are low or no calories. Both Coke Zero and Diet Coke are sugar-free and contain less than one calorie per can, with the following drinks being low or no calorie. 
Coke Zero, Diet Coke, Diet Coke with Cherry, Diet Coke with the Citrus Zest in the UK, and many others. This ploy works under the very common assumption that low calorie anything equates to something healthy, which nine times out of 10 is horrendously false. For example, an 11 year old Harvard medical study of more than 3,000 women found that Diet Cola is associated with a twofold increased risk for kidney decline. What's more, according to a 2008 University of Minnesota study of almost 10,000 adults, just one diet soda a day is linked to a 34% higher risk of metabolic syndrome with symptoms include, including belly fat and high cholesterol that put you at risk for heart disease. Major food companies like Coke um, have the people found out. They will buy whatever boasts being low or zero calorie because of a constructed equivocation of health and low calories. Processed sweeteners such as um, it's a weird word. Um, it starts with an A, potassium, and aspartame uh, found in diet soda are the direct cause of the dietary problem. Artificial sweeteners are hundreds to thousands of times sweeter than regular sugar, activating our genetically programmed preference for sweet taste more than any other substance. They trick your metabolism into thinking sugar is on its way. This causes your body to pump out insulin, the fat storage hormone, which lays down more belly fat. It also confuses and slows your metabolism down, so you burn fewer calories every day. So, a day in the life of us. As discussed in the beginning of the speech, there are two sides of this issue, the powerful and the powerless. There exists on the side of the proletariat, the poor and the less educated, and at the side of the bourgeoisie, the corporations out to use poverty and ignorance to its advantage. When the main motive of only 10 food companies controlling the entirety of the food industry in the U.S. is profit and not your health, a widespread health famine ensues. First, let us look at how much it costs to live a stable American lifestyle. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the average size of an American household is three, which at many times consists of a single parent. According to the Poverty Project's living wage calculator, the living wage for a standard American household living in Fulton County, Georgia, is $22.63 uh, per hour. It calculates that this family will spend monthly $536 on food per month, and with other expenses including medical and transportation, spend $47,078 on all life expenses. These are values a standard adult must attain to stay alive, and unfortunately minimum wage is $7.25 since nationwide, with an annual income rate of 49445 as it pertains to the middle class. To be completely realistic, these numbers are not conducive to an entire nation whose households, being predominantly single-parented as of late, and most do not have the time or the federal backup to reach the standards exemplified by these numbers. We are analyzing a nation of people who, for the most part, fall short of their own standard of living. According to a recent study, it cost about $238 per person to live purely on an organic and healthy diet without the time not available to farm because work is a priority. That amounts to, in an average American household, $714 a month, significantly above the living wage projection of food expenses. But what you can't afford is killing you. So you can't afford $714 a month it takes to be truly healthy. Luckily, your local supermarket offers many of the same options, only most of its meats, fruits, and vegetables are not only cheaper, but shinier too. This is where knowing that 10 companies control the flow of food goods because, really, um, because it's really important because all your options in the grocery store are there by the whim of this, these big three. You shop, and like an average American, you scoop up for dinner an entree consisting of either beef, pork, or poultry. Because according to the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, you should eat at least 29 cuts of beef, 6 cuts of pork, and numerous poultry cuts that are leaner and have less calories than 3 ounces serving of salad, and 2 or 3 sides of starches and vegetables, sparing it. Your meat was probably uh, packed and processed by Tyson, or Car Grill, or JBS, or National Beef, four of the top meat packing companies in the country. Tyson the world's largest meat processor and the second largest chicken producer in the U.S., specifically has recently been put under the radar after a USDA poultry inspector, Sherry Medina, released a complaint stating that the chemicals used in the plant where she inspects poultry have seriously impacted her own health. An affidavit she released to GAP details the, ex the extent of these health problems, including asthma attack, 
asthma attacks, sinus problems, and even organ damage. Her failing health has seriously impacted her lifestyle and may have ended her 16-year career as an, an inspector. The same company that put that packaged meat in your local grocery store also treated their meat with antibiotics that, along with the chemicals to preserve it, were not made for human congestion, but will soon be making its way into your body. Now to the vegetables and starches. As talked about slightly above, Monsanto is leading the world in genetically engineered or GMO seeds of vegetables and fruits we eat on a daily basis. In a recent study uh, conducted by the Institute for Responsible Technology, GMO diets and animals show progressive organ damage, gastrointestinal and immune system disorders, accelerated aging, and infertility. Human studies show how genetically modified food can leave material behind inside us, possibly causing long-term problems. Genes inserted into GM soy, for example, can transfer into the DNA of bacteria living inside of us, and that the toxic intestinal produced by GM corn was found in the blood of pregnant women and their unborn fetuses. Monsanto owns more than 12% of the seed market, thus making it very likely what you are about to ingest is indeed relevant to my hypothetical. And if you want to drink a little soda on the side and want to avoid the caloric monsters of actual Coke, pick up a two liter Diet Coke and enjoy all of the symptoms mentioned above. So, how to escape a food genocide with dummies? As explained above, we are being silently and mercilessly poisoned by major food corporations who have no interest in your health but their wallets. Politically and scientifically, they pervade your taste buds and diets leaving residual toxins to haunt you and your loved ones until you suffer from the many health problems associated and reach critical conditions. This is what it means to be a part of a few genocide, and though getting in the line for the smoke chamber was as easy as biting into a burger, getting out, getting out of it will be harder. However, it is all possible. First, we answer their political onslaught in kind with our own. As Raj Patel mentions in his book, we might want to put our faith in various competition or antitrust commissions that exist in certain countries in order to prevent the formulation of oligopolies that control the food industry. Such faith will be misplaced. When firms want to consolidate, they approach these agencies with a range of justifications. The foundational argument in Darwin, uh, Darwinism, the market is a mechanism through which the fittest survive and the government ought not to interfere to save an entity doomed to its extension at the hands of a rival. We assume the role of the game changer transforming the criteria for success in our society and our group of people so that the balance tips in the favor of true equality in our health. This starts with you educating the masses on the atrocities of Monsanto, attacking the consciences of our politicians, and getting them on the side of humanity in an effort to save an entire class of people. Thank you.
Um, if you take a look uh, at some of our statistics for here in America, we, we don't think that we have a problem. Um, our per capita food production has steadily increased as has our uh, income. So why, why would we have a problem with hunger? Um, there's, there are these efforts around the world to reduce the issue of poverty and hunger. Um, and despite all of these overwhelming statistics, again, uh, it still just sort of seems like a distant, a distant issue. Uh, but we do have a right to food, and we have, it's not just the right to, to eat or to feed yourself. We have the right to adequate, accessible, available food. Um, we have the right to have regular, permanent, and unrestricted access either directly or by means of financial purchases to quantitatively and qualitatively adequate and sufficient food. And I'm gonna talk a lot about what that means, what adequate, sufficient, and accessible actually means. Uh, availability of food, um, it's, it's uh, here on the screen you can read that, but there's also, it needs to be healthy food. You know, being able to go just to the grocery store and pick up food uh, doesn't mean that your right to food has been is being met. Because if it's not healthy food that's available, if it's food that's um, or organic food, if it's food that's filled with GMOs or or whatever the like, it's still uh, going, going to be a problem. Um, this map was really telling for me because uh, this world map is showing the food, like the, the laws uh, associated with food around the world. Um, the purple, you can see, those are all countries that are uh, involved in adopting a draft work, so they're on their way there. And then it, it, as it sort of increases, you can see um, that America here has no color because we have no known right uh, to foods in our, like formally declared. Um, again, we don't really see it as, we don't really see our access to food as a problem. We see it as more of a income, issue of income or laziness or uh, we, we put a lot of the blame on victims uh, as opposed to seeing hungry people or malnourished people in our own country as uh, victims of the system. Um, one of the books that we read was Raj Patel's Stuffed and Starved, as uh, Sam uh, and Chris mentioned, I think. Um, and this sort of highlights more of the problem as well, because while we're getting richer, people are getting, or yeah, while we're getting richer and producing more food, um, people are still growing more and more hungry. And that was a concept that we couldn't quite understand, and Raj Patel really made that clear to us that um, it's, it's a symptom of not just um, poor, impoverished countries, but also some of the nature's richest, richest countries like our own. We have problems with obesity. We have problems with uh, children dying because of because food corporations are more interested in uh, what will get what will help them get money as opposed to what will help us get healthy. Um, sugar is toxic for our bodies, but incredibly. Uh, income producing for the corporations so we don't we don't see it as, as much of, of a problem because our economic system has been studied from a place of scarcity as opposed to uh, abundance which is where we're currently at you know we, we are not um, a lot of the government a lot of the subsidies that went toward toward farming created abundance of things and that abundance then ended up leading to our lack, interestingly, and we, we really went through that in detail um, in the class. And um, I, I wanted to, to talk about our right to freedom because I began to ask myself, how free are we when our taste buds are scientifically studied and then our preferences are analytically determined and by, by race and culture? Um, that's, that's a, I, it felt like a violation. It felt like, felt violated as I was sort of sitting there reading about um, African-Americans having a preference for 
salt and sugar and a certain consistency of the food and there's these sensors that go from our tongue down our throats that they engineer food scientifically to be appealing for and it you know you're, you're reading that sort of nodding and thinking yeah that's true but then um, came the violate the violating feeling of wow this is you know are my choices my own or why, why do I make the choices that I make and that helps to in our in our rhetoric class we are understanding arguments and it, it helped us to sort of see the arguments in a lot of the food advertisements and uh, food literature, anything that we read, uh, the Food Food Network, um, which became hard to watch even after after learning as much as we did um, about how just just how much they know and how they how they're using what they know um, to sort of commoditize uh, our generation, particularly uh, we are the largest generation America's ever seen. Um, we I think it's natural at OU to start thinking. Uh, what will history books say about us, about our generation, as we're sort of critiquing so much about history ourselves. And I, it's like, I fear that people will say, how could that generation do so little with so much? Because we, we, we do have an abundance of, of everything, um, but the, the, the main problem is that we waste it. Um, there's 23 million people uh, who go hungry in America, and um, what we waste in food could very well feed uh, the people who are hungry. Um, and that statistic was brought up a lot in Stuffed and Starved, and that sort of uh, dynamic there, and it's uh, almost embarrassing. Um, this is sort of detailing what I was just saying, that the 25 million people who go <coughs> hungry could be fed if we were to reduce food waste by just 15%. That's not like, let's take 100% of the food that we waste and give it to the poor people. That's realistically, we could just cut waste by 15% and feed the 23 million people uh, in our country um, to, to have the mobility that we have, the access to information that we have, um, and not do something about that um, just feels wrong. Um, the existence of, of food deserts is sort of the, the product of of our uh, the the distribution to the the, the sorry the uh, food distribution is not equal. It's, I'm trying to think of the word for inadequate, and it's not coming to my mind, I apologize. But it's, um, in places, in urban communities, there are uh, miles that people will have to travel to in order to get to a grocery store or, or to have access, access to fresh food. Um, and a lot of people, you know, we ask ourselves why people are obese or why is this in urban neighborhoods? And if you're, you know, wanting to feed an entire family, you could pay five dollars for a salad or one dollar for a burger, and a lot of times that decision gets made towards the, the less healthy side, and then we call that laziness, or um, you know just put a lot of shame on the families that are making that decision um, when literally the food is not available. Um, they they don't have the access to. Oh, some of them don't have the access to the appropriate, adequate food that they need, and that is a violation of their rights right here in America. So reading about that in our books, um, sort of opening your eyes to it, you know, I, I, just even as I would drive down the street and, or, or go inside like a little bodega where bana a banana is like $2 or something insane, it's, you, you, can, you start to see it. It's, 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 it's like hidden in plain view. Um, and again, with, uh, we, we, we share everything as a generation. We will tweet, Instagram, post, whatever. Um, we, we know, we know what's going on. And so to, to know and to not do anything again was just um, the reason why I, I felt really passionate about everything about this, about this topic and the, the existence of food deserts so close to home. They exist in Atlanta, they, they exist everywhere. Um, it was really a problem for, for, for me. Um, so the, 
the political, that, that brought me to the political aspect of food insecurity, because if this is such a problem, and why aren't we doing something, why doesn't legislation address it, um, there really isn't a cohesive message there. There isn't a, a or, or method there. Um, we, as you saw on that first map, we don't really have uh, any policy, any policy surrounding that. Um, but other countries have a, a lot of them. Their uh, food security is more technical, um, whereas the right to food is legal, and food sovereignty is where it became political. And um, we just have to look at it. You know, I I had this uh, quote in my paper about um, John Adams perhaps being disappointed with us as our constitution might not seem wholly inadequate to any other right now, um, specifically since we're, we're not addressing fundamental rights to food. Um, it seems like we're the third world country in that respect. Um, so food sovereignty is, de is defined as the right of people's communities and countries to define their own, to define their own. Um, that's a really important part of that, to, because a lot of times we'll, we have food aid, what we call food aid, going to uh, countries where we'll just send them massive tons of rice, and we'll call it culturally appropriate because, well, it's rice and that's what they eat, and um, it, it's ignorant, though, because obviously, because that can't be all that they eat. We need to have to eat diverse amounts of food, and we need to be able to dictate what that is ourselves. Um, that's a part of our right to food, is our ability to, to, to feed ourselves with dignity. Um, so uh, I really just wanted to put up the, the definition for, of food sovereignty so it would be clear uh, what that means. You know, this is not a luxury. Um, this is not something that the best of the best get to, get to have. You know, this is a fundamental right. Um, and we're sort of ignoring our own fundamental right because it's, there are certain messages hidden in the rhetoric, uh, but we have to, we have, like in this class we learn to be aware of what those messages are and um, how to decipher them moving forward and what to do about it in our own lives, so. Um, yeah. Because when I discuss the salt, sugar, and fat aspect, they don't engineer it so that it's it's nutritious to your body. They engineer it so that it's addictive, so that you can continue to buy it, irregardless of what kind of health benefits you get. And so it's all about profit margin. Do you think in the near The near future might be a stretch. Um, I think that there's a, 
there's a debate right now about, you know, like a, they'd like to convince us that we can use the fast food system that we have in place right now to deliver healthy food to people because, well, they're everywhere and we can't put organic farms on every block. Um, but, I mean, if we can put McDonald's on every block, we can, we can also put farms everywhere. And McDonald's is not ever going to be more concerned about our, our health than their pocket. So um, I, I don't, that's the reason that I don't think a answer is going to be available soon, it's particularly if we're leaning in that direction. Um, I think it's going to be something that we have to take reins of ourselves. And um, it's one of those things that communities have to demand. They love to say, in all of the, the documentaries that we would watch, they would constantly repeat that if the market were demanding organic food, that's what we would produce. You know, every every big CEO of any food corporation were like, well, if that's what they wanted, that's what I'd do. Um, as if we just want to have like the toxins in our bodies. Um, so in order to demand that, we're gonna have to take it upon ourselves so that they feel that pinch um, financially, which causes them to make changes. Uh, I guess this question is for you, Strick. And the, uh, I guess the historical context of America monopolies, you know, are a big problem for a lot of our, uh, I guess, industries and a lot of, you know, civilian problems, citizen problems. So I guess my question is in a modern perspective, especially with that graph you put up, how do you, a lot of these like top 10 corporations are kind of like modern monopolies. So how do we rectify that politically and how do we, you know, control that so that way the producer or consumer in the future doesn't get screwed over by, I guess, a lack of government oversight. Right, and that's a question that I had myself. Um, and in the, the food class, we um, had the opportunity to discuss and interview Mark Sutton, who wrote um, Heart Healthy Pizza, or, yeah, Heart Healthy Pizza. And uh, my questioning actually won me a free book, but I asked him, <laughs> I asked him if he were president, how would he go about just what you asked him? And he said he would enforce policy that would break up these consolidations. As far as when I showed you the graph, there's only a number of corporations that mass produced them. He's saying break that up, and then also have more like bureau bureaucratic type, like um, kind of like how the FDA works. Have more of those and have more oversight over all the consolidations once you break them up. So that not only do you have more people producing stuff, but you have institutions in place to monitor each and every one of these broken up consolidations. I agree with them. Research, there's a number of like, I don't know what they're called, but they're groups like uh, they embark in urban farming. Um, and I kind of spoke to that in my presentation saying that would it, it wouldn't be conducive to the regular Atlanta and American family whose single parented and specifically single mother homes wouldn't be able to work a nine to five and then also nurture a garden in the backyard. And so there is a sense of helplessness, but there's also a sense of we do grant these food industries like a certain level of trust and that they are making our food. And we can't all, we don't, I mean, a lot of us in here don't even have the time to grow a farm, you know, on the quad right now. But um, I did research that, but I didn't think it was conducive to anything just because the, the standard American family works more than they would ever have the time to farm something. How do we more like local sourcing? So for example, if I was to get my vegetables as opposed to going to Kroger and getting from their produce section, going to a smaller farmer's market that buys from North Georgia farmers or South Georgia farmers, for example. Things like that, so your food is fresher faster. But I don't know if you found if it's cost effective or if it's viable for like urban areas. Mm -hmm. Not individual farming, because we don't have something. I, I think unfortunately it's been um, sort of a, a class distinction, and if you can go to a farmer's market, it's because you have financial means and you live in that area um, and, and that's um, 
you know, for me, where it was a, like a violation of your right because a farmer's market should not be available to people in a certain class. Um, those things exist for sure. Um, I think we come across them a lot. Um, I come across it in my own neighborhood, but um, it doesn't address the hunger issue that we have for um, for food. It's it's not a solution in food deserts because the people who would build something like that um, in neighborhoods where they're built now, like Chris is saying, it's just not a, it's not realistic. It's not uh, viable for them. It's just why they need help uh, to be able to do that. I mean, there are certain systems like. Uh, there's a place where um, if you get food stamps, your food stamps are worth twice as much at whole at or an organic market than they would be elsewhere, and that's sort of their way of equalizing things. Um, so that was that's one that that I read about that was that I thought is pretty effective, uh, but that does, that's not a, a federal or national standard. You know, that's just a small thing. Just on a final note about that, um, another uh, one of the issues beyond that, like I know the Nashville Farmers Market does accept uh, food stamps, um, but the products that are sold in supermarkets tend to be larger and last uh, for a longer period of time, so they like keep longer um, and they're cheaper. So um, people don't really see the point in like going organic. They don't think the health benefits outweigh like the extra price, even if it's a couple cents. Dollar. Um, part of the issue seems also like the populations that these foods are targeted to may not have information or knowledge, understanding about this. I mean, you're educated people, and you, you know, didn't weren't aware of this before you took the class, and, um, and so then I was thinking about ways you could get this out, you know, and then I was thinking YouTube video, and I realized, wait a minute, I don't know necessarily would be online. So are there ways that that you can think of that you could reach populations just to educate them about the fact that the foods that they are eating are uh, not so beneficial for their long term health? This was another um that, that's a question that I had also, and it was another just sort of rough area because food literacy starts at in the kitchen at home. Um, and with parents working as much as they do now, and that sort of not existing anymore, um, that's where it, the breakdown is happening. Because we don't really address it in school unless it's a topic that you specifically go seek out. Go seek out, or if you apply your knowledge that you're learning in, in health or whatever the case, if you can apply that, then you'll be good. But um, food literacy has sort of always happened at home, um, which is why it's such a big part of our identity. Um, so. Uh, I think it have to be addressed on a systematic level in our education um, and made a priority in order for the message to really get out. Um, but also, if it's trendy enough, it'll it'll work too. I mean, kale and other there's a, there's all kinds of food trends that happen, but they pass like trends do. So the message kind of gets out there, but you know we 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 also want to sort of distance ourselves from the full truth because, yes, we like organic food. I like organic food, but I like a McDonald's every now and then also. So there's that, you know. So there's um, uh, the, the, the message being out there and then the message being taken seriously, I think, are uh, two different issues. Did you come across anything in your research with um, regards to insurance companies? I did not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I do know that Kaiser Permanente came out with a statement, I think it was last summer, um, promoting um, you know, fruits and vegetables almost as a prescription for health and, and also came out against genetically modified organisms. They say it affects the cost to them. When they yeah. Come in. Right. Yeah. And, and that's shocking because that's, a, that's the only health organization I know that is really promoting that kind of program. Another program I was thinking of is uh, some of the farm to school programs where they take children out to farms and say, look, here's where a vegetable really comes from and vegetables are not yucky. Pull the carrot out of the ground and take a bite. Isn't that sweet? You know, and it's it's a shocking reality for some children, you know, that 
they've only seen perhaps canned vegetables and so I think that's a, a viable alternative is to really show kids where food comes from and even involve them in preparation of food. Uh, this is not uh, for anyone, but uh, you address mostly uh, problems of urban and suburban food distribution. Uh, so you know, our parents live in a subdivision where they're five miles by roads to get to any any supermarket. But uh, I mean, at your Oglethorpe, you can walk to Kroger in half an hour. It's not. You know, but how do you deal with you know, someone who lives in Dublin, Georgia? And you, it takes them 45 minutes to drive to the nearest supermarket where you can't, and even if you build more uh, farmers markets and so forth, it's, you're going to have these people who are the rural poor and they're too far away so that when they when they take these, these trips, you know, they can't go to the, the supermarket twice a week because it's a 40 minute drive, there's gas prices involved, the, the time involved and so forth. Uh, and so they have to buy either frozen foods or heavily preserved foods. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to go bad, and they're not. Gonna, by the time they go to the supermarket the next time, they're going to have three days where there's, there's no food because it's all going bad in their pantry. Uh, what what solutions are there for the the rural population for more uh, ice, the less processed food? So frozen foods don't lose nutritional value over time uh, via the food process. Like they're not processed the same way as uh, like canned foods are or uh, fast foods are so frozen foods could be fine, but um, there's always the option of gardening. Um, but also, I know uh, like taking group trips, uh, buying in bulk would be a fine option. Um, but I think going to the supermarkets and like demanding like placement in that uh, town, even if it's like a half size supermarket, like it doesn't have to be like fancy Kroger that we just got, but like like a half size. So you have all your basic amenities. Um, Maybe classes are brought in to like teach people how to like make their own bread or make their own uh, soup, or you know, and then that way they have more options in what they can eat. Um, they don't have to buy bread twice a week because bread will go bad. Like they know how to make bread, so they can make appropriately sized loaves if that's something yeah. that they're. Food, food literacy is a big part of the problem, but I mean, we what we all recognize in the class is that there isn't a solution that's not going to hurt a little bit or cost us our convenience. You know, we, we will have to give up some of our convenience. Um, if it means you have to go to the grocery store more than once a week um, in order to have wholesome food, and that's what it will be. Um, if we are better educated or if we are, take it into our own hands and have our own gardens or whatever the case, or if there's community level gardens, I mean, in other countries, they go to, this, they go to the little corner, you know, person selling the food that they just grew every single day. That's a normal part of their daily life and their routine. Um, here we have the convenience of, I need to stack up, I can't go, you know, like that we have a certain mentality around food in general and our entire food process. And that will have to change fundamentally if we want to see the results that we need to see. That's a tough question. Yeah. I, I guess we don't have that answer My question is to mention you know, um, in your opinion, how would you begin to tackle the one of the big as unhealthy cultural, cultural food trends when awareness doesn't seem to be enough? Because if you look at um, really those who are supposed to be such an informed segment of the population, we have uh, them going to fast food places and so on, knowing food is that process and that bad for you. So I guess my question would be like, how do you address a culture that just doesn't care anymore? And how do you change a group of people's eating habits if awareness is you know, and uh, food literacy is not as, I would say, valued as I would say. So that's a great question. Um, I'd say overall, um, we don't care because we're addicted to the foods and it's easy and convenient to go to um, McDonald's. It takes a lot of discipline while taking this class. Um, I didn't eat meat twice, uh, like two, two days out of the week I wouldn't eat meat, and like those two days were like the hardest, like day of the week, like every week I could switch it up, it could be on a weekend, it could be like one day and a Friday, it wouldn't matter, um, and it's weird how much you crave certain foods when you don't have certain foods, um, I think it's just going to take a lot of discipline, maybe demanding the fast food 
companies to like um, improve their selection of healthy foods. Because um, even the salads at McDonald's have like saturated fats, which is kind of like shocking. If you look at it, like their dressing is like horrible. But um, if every if everybody would just stop buying at McDonald's, like even for like a week, everybody just stopped buying at McDonald's, they would do enough to change it. But I mean, what to me it sounds like a vicious cycle then, because if you keep trying to get them to change it, you don't yourself want to change the products on there. How do we begin to change? Get them to give us more healthy options. Well, I mean, I think I might disagree that we don't care. Um, I, I don't think that anyone is sort of like, I'm going to go to McDonald's because I don't care about the fact that there is talk, you know, I'm unaffected by these fat, these set of facts. Um, I think that, that we are addicted to convenience and to the point where it becomes a necessity. And because there aren't readily available solutions, we do what we need to do and keep moving. Um, the, the big corporations marketing also give us permission. They give us all kinds of permission to fulfill, you know, like if we go and convince ourselves that having the smoothie or the salad is, is better, um, we're still sort of making a bad decision but giving ourselves permission. So it's really, it's, it's really easy to uh, say, no, we need to go organic, we need to have everything be brought to me from some farm directly to my fork. Um, but that just isn't realistic, and we. But I think that we have to focus on who's supplying as opposed to who's buying, because the issue is, is a bigger systematic issue, um, and trying to change behavior. Government can't change behavior, you know. Um, and so, as far as systematic solutions, um, it, it it's going to have to take a, a different course. But for us, for our own solutions, we have to just take it into our own hands and uh, do whatever it is that we can do as much as we can and make it a priority um, because it's our lives, because our lives depend on it, our, our children's lives depend on it. It's not something where if we act like it doesn't exist, it'll go away. It's only going to get worse. So um, I think um, just bringing awareness to the severity of the issue and the, the level of urgency needed um, is our first step. As far, as far as your question, Lamar, I think that <clears throat> our generation kind of feels that a lot of a lot of things need to be handed to us, just because as far as information gathering and stuff like that, it's all instant. You can, you can get it. You just with a simple Google search, just whip your phone out. You can do all sorts of things with it. I think our generation needs to go through a fundamental understanding that we can change the hegemony if we do certain things. Like as far as what Sam was saying, with the discipline. Like, we have all sorts of information at our fingertips. All that I talk to you today, you can find that with a simple Google search, and you'll see these things. Once you understand that these things are bad for you, like, all of us can change the system if we just stop doing certain things. Like, if we all stop going to McDonald's, for example, as hard as that would be, it would be hard for me. I love McDonald's French fries. But if you were just to stop doing it, that would ruin McDonald's, like, profit margin. They realize, okay, wait, we need to change some things up. What's appealing to these guys? If they want health, I guess we're going to have to change the health makeup. Because um, if you, I know a lot of us recently, we experienced McDonald's like dubbing down the caloric content of their food, but not necessarily the nutritional value. And that was because, I was, as I was talking about with Coke's new trend, low calories equals health. And so when we respond to that and we boycotted McDonald's for the most part, they dubbed down the caloric content. If we were to beg, well not beg, but fight for health in our foods, McDonald's would have no choice but to change the way their food's made because they got to make money at the end of the day. And so, in a nutshell, generation needs to realize that we do have a lot of power at our fingertips, but not everything is going to be given to us. Um, with that, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, <laughs> we're going to hang out for a little bit. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to come and talk to us. Thank you so much.